Greetings, 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 Rotarians and guests. So welcome, everybody. Uh, I think we've got the bugs worked out. Can I get a, a head coach to see you at the top of the Zoom chart there? Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Uh -oh. Head coach. <laughs> can you hear us on Zoom? Anybody? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you everybody. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, again, a little Zoom etiquette to our friends at Zoom World there. If you can please mute yourself when you're not speaking, that really helps us with the audio stuff going on here. Uh, but if you do have something to say, by all means, unmute yourself if you want to hear from me. So. Ken? Yes. Can you have someone turn the camera around so we can see who's at the podium? Sure. I, I don't Thank know how you. to do it, Hank, but we'll, we'll get on it. <laughs> oh, there I, I see me. Oh, right. There I am. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, Mary Ann, would you lead us in the question? Yeah, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So uh, I know everybody's looking forward to this today, our veteran, annual Veterans Day program, right? Uh, usually very cool, op great opportunity for us to hear from some local veterans. I know we're all looking forward to that. So Songsters, what have you got teed up for us today? Uh oh, can you hear me now? Yes, you can. You can hear me now. OK, well, it's. It's Veterans Day, and we, we had to come up with something for Veterans Day. And I was thinking of Leo Croce and uh, Jasper. Jasper's favorite song was Old, uh, Old Flag. Um, but we didn't know that song. So I think they all uh, became our heroes because they love this country. So we did America the Beautiful. And I have to give credit to Tim on his green violin and the banjo and Stu on the piano and, and that other guy on guitar and vocal. <laughs> oh, beautiful, oh, spacious skies, oh, Tim, what do you got for us? Tim? Tim? Is Tim out there? <laughs> He's being timid. Did we lose Tim? You need to unmute Tim. How about that? I was a good soldier being on mute all that time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, every Veterans Day, I think about the service of my brother, Mike, who's a sailor on uh, uh, a ship during the Vietnam War. And my dad's service is a skipper on a destroyer escort in the uh, South Pacific during World War II. 
Uh, we always uh, love the flag raising and parades and singing our national anthem. And uh, as Michael said, this was a song, You're a Grand Old Flag, that I think of at these times. You're a grand old flag, you're a high flying flag, and forever in peace you may wait. You're the emblem of the land I love, the home of the free and the brave. Every heart beats true for the red, white, and blue, where the terror of foes go by. Susan Mayall is holding down the Spur Reporter job for us today. So Susan, thank you for that. Much appreciated. Alan Frank, thank you for all your efforts on AD. Uh, exponentially more difficult than it used to be. Uh, so appreciate all your efforts on that. David Rounds uh, monitoring the Zoom chat. Thank you, David. Hey, Ken, David yeah. here. Yeah. Um, your, your, your sound is very echoey and muted. Uh, turn on your microphone. I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> but thanks for the feedback. Is that any better? No. Well, we'll, we'll keep we'll keep tweaking stuff and uh, uh, maybe uh, send those notes through the Zoom chat if we're getting if that situation. Well, now we can't hear you at all. So, Jeff. Now, try. Yes, Kathy. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> I'll send you a text, Jeff. In the chat. Copy. Okay, well, thanks. I'm back, I guess. Um, where are we? So I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to welcome any guests. And I see we have a guest joining us today. So Sonia, would you be willing to introduce your guest? I would like to, can you hear me? I would like to introduce Kathleen Cabot. She is from Livermore by way of Albuquerque, and she's interested in joining our Rotary all right. Welcome, Kathleen. And, and people at that table be nice. <laughs> Best behavior. Let's not scare Kathleen off. Come on. I know. I know we've got our speakers uh, out there on Zoom today, we'll, and we'll introduce them in a few minutes. But do we have any other uh, visiting Rotarians or guests joining us via Zoom today? I'm going to take that as no. So, so let's rock, roll right into some announcements. Uh, Marianne, can you give us all an update on all the money that we're giving away? Right? Can I do it here? You want me to sure. there? Uh, she just got a mic for you. How's that? Okay. I just wanted to remind everybody that the club grants are due December 1st, which is the first Wednesday in December. At the moment, I only have two grants, so I'm getting a little worried about that because we definitely have funds to cover several grants. So if you know any teachers, uh, community groups, it doesn't have to be just the school. So just wanted to remind people about that. And then the Rotarian Foundation the grants are due December 8th, and at the moment, I have six grants there. And remember, those grants go between three and five thousand dollars. Last year we gave away eighty-one thousand plus for twenty-two organizations. So if you know anyone 
to meet some friends to go along with their projects, um, please contact them. And the applications are all online. They can fill them out. It's really easy. So go to work, guys. All right. Thank you, Marianne. Okay, so we're, we're carrying, let's get the word out, right? Uh, we have money to help uh, good causes. And every good cause deserves some free money, right? So, Irv, you're working on a project. Can you share with us uh, what you've got? Yeah. Uh, Mike, uh, Mike Thompson is heading up a 75th uh, anniversary project. And I believe it's going to be at Coffee Ridge. I think he's made it if our treasurer was here, I would have confirmed that, but it's planned for February 26th next year. And I have two bullets. I'm looking for old pictures because we're going to either have a, you know, a rotating slideshow or a series of posters at the event or a booklet. And this is the beginning of the booklet. But if it gets up to around 100 pages or more, we may uh, auction them off. <laughs> Um, and going to look at that. Um, and um, the other thing I'm after is historical uh, stories. And I, I talked to, to Tom TJ this morning about some of his um, his period projects that were in, in India. I think that we made large donations there. But we want to document those and then see, see if we can find it from the event to put into uh, into the Photoshop. Thank you. Thank you, Irv. So that's pretty cool. Sounds like a fun project dating back to the 75 years of history. It's off. Mike's off. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I hope so. Okay. So, yes. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you, Zoomers. Uh, so next up, uh, we'd like to give Beth Wilson a few minutes to share with us about her experience, uh, you know, firsthand dealing with polio plus and getting immunizations out there in India. So Beth, come on back. President Ken, can everybody hear me in Zoom land? Okay. Um, about six years ago, just about six years ago, I got an email, and I seem to be the only one in our club who has had gotten it, but it was from Howard Travel in Oakland, and it was about participating in a National Immunization Day in India through Rotary. It sounded exciting, I love to travel, um, so I signed up, and I asked my cousin Helen uh, to join us. She's not a Rotarian, but she's a Rotarian type of person. She did join us. Uh, she's, and we went together. We were there for almost two weeks. And of course, we were taken to see all the sites in Delhi and in Agra and in Jaipur. They're what's called the Golden Triangle um, in kind of the northwest part of India. But the point of the trip was educating us about the polio situation in India, as well as we were there to immunize children. So we had lectures and classes and field trips. We found out that India was declared officially polio free a few years before then, but all the children under age five still needed to be immunized every year because the vaccine, the, the virus was still lurking around. Um, next. Thank you. We went to St. Stephen's Hospital in Delhi to a project that was sponsored by the Rotary Club of Delhi Midtown and TRF. So it was a whole uh, section of this hospital. The patients were older children and teens, and they were undergoing corrective surgery, physical therapy, so that they could have more normal lives, like for young people, as you can see. A couple of days later, a group was taken to a school in the slums of Delhi that was sponsored by one of the local Rotary clubs. The younger students, as you see here, learned the basics, and then we brought them some supplies. For some reason, they had me hand the supplies, but they weren't things I specifically brought. We all brought a few things. The older students also learned really practical trades, such as sewing and henna painting, which doesn't seem practical to us, but that's something that they, it's a trade that people learn to do. Um, and they had computer classes also, and some of the activities that we did see. 
and Rotary Club next. Thank you. Rotary Club also had built this playground, which, as you can see, was not exactly maintained, or Tim particularly can tell, not up to code. It looks like the sort of thing that we had when we were in elementary school. But, oh, there also were pigs moving around and that, and you can see the garbage and everything. But at least there was some open space for the kids to uh, play in. After about a week of sightseeing, we went uh, back to Delhi and participated in the rally that you saw in the first slide with all the people. There's thousands of people from many countries at that rally. Altogether, there were two and a half million people fanned out across India for this um, national immunization that they were doing to vaccinate as many children as possible. This is the village um, our small group was taken to. It was a Muslim village that was about an hour from Delhi proper. Delhi has uh, 18 million people, so trying to tell where Delhi started and stopped was a little bit tricky. Um, but um, this is the main square. You can't see the buffaloes in, in this picture, but the water buffaloes um, were pretty much wandered around on paved streets in the yards and <laughs> did their thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Things weren't paved. <sighs> and the word had gone out, and we were expected at the community center. This was probably about two thirds of the size of this room that we are in now, the Palo Verde room. Uh, at, and it didn't. It was a dirt floor, packed dirt floor. Um, but um, that's where we were expected to be there. And so four of us Rotarians were there, my cousin and I, and a couple actually from Morgan Hill, the only people who lived anywhere near close to where I did. We, of course, were quite an attraction. And pretty much all the kids in the village must have been there. They were just swarming with kids who were so bright eyed and, and fascinated. It was a local health professional. And we also had four young men of the village, uh, teenagers who were our helpers. Very self-important, of course. In twos, we supported the young children, gave the two drops, and then marked a fingernail on each of them with in indelible markers so it would be clear who had been immunized. Because, of course, parents very often figure if a little bit is good, then more would be better. So let me, you know, bring my kid in again. So that way we would know that they had been immunized from the parents who maybe were reluctant to have it, but not over immunized. The following day, we went back to the village to capture those who might have been missed. The Indian professional would knock on the doors while my cousin and I entertained all the kids that were following us around um, and got the families immunized who hadn't been there the day before. And you can see how she's writing the dates on the door so that everybody could tell, yes, that had been taken care of. I give to Polio Plus every year, of course because being in India helped me see for myself the tremendous, huge need and the great importance of, of helping eradicate this horrible, awful disease. I urge each of you to support this critical work. It is a proven way to support so many people. Our dollars go so far. And Monday, what did we see in the news? Taliban is now allowing and supporting um, the vaccinations to go forth in Afghanistan. So this opens up you know, a new area, but obviously we'll take more funds. So, please join me. <laughs> Thank you. Hey. So again, what a cool organization to be part of, right? That we're able to be uh, not just good citizens in our local community, but good citizens in the world, and really helping people all over the place. So thank you for sharing that bucket trip there. That, that's, that's new. So uh, next up, Alan, you wanted to tell us about an yeah. art program. Yeah, there's an art, a Tri-Valley art event occurring this weekend. It's an open studio tour where many of the artists in the Valley, in the Valley have their studios open to the public. It's a free event. My wife and I will have our studio open, showing her paintings and my photographs. And uh, there's a website here that you can see all of the other uh, artists in the valley. And there are 30 some odd uh, people involved. And it, so it's going to be Saturday and Sunday, 
from 10 to 5. And if any of you have any questions, please ask me. Is it downtown? No, this is at our studio at our home. Oh, all of the artists are going to be at your house? No, 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 no. They're all spread around at their homes. I can find them. Uh, on the website, tvast.com, T-V-A-S-T dot com. Now, a few of the artists will be showing at the Bothwell. So there are several there, but that's more of an, an exhibit rather than an open studio. This is an opportunity to see where work actually goes on and how it goes on. Yes. So what cool. time between 10 and 4? 10 and, 10 and 5, yeah. 10 and 5. And you're buying lunch? <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a few <laughs> snacks of some kidding. sort. No, we're I'm not. Just kidding. We're not buying lunch. Alan's not buying lunch. I don't I'm expect kidding. we'll even get lunch. <laughs> He's going to be busy. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for sharing that. So, yeah, it's really an opportunity to support, uh, support the arts in our community, right? Very cool. So, every week I get last minute stuff. Oh, tell everybody about this. Tell everybody about this. So just wanted to give everybody a heads up, maybe I'll have some more information later. Uh, the Rotary Club of Dublin is doing something kind of cool. They are trying to gather gloves and socks for homeless people uh, this holiday season as the weather's turning cold. So if that tugs at your heartstrings, resonates with you, let me know and I'll get you information. Uh, it's pretty easy to do. You can go on to Amazon and order it and ship it directly to them, right? So they've made it super easy. Uh, but if that's something that you're interested in, let me know. I'll get you more information about that. So. Okay, next week, you're not going to want to miss this. We're talking about the arts. Splen, are you, I saw you out there. Splen, do you want to introduce or tell us about our speaker next week? Sure. Can you see, hear me and see me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, um, just leading on, on what Alan just talked about, um, so the city of Livermore actually has a plan. And uh, Adam Vandewater is the uh, head of the um, Innovation Economic Development Office for the city of Livermore. And he's going to be our speaker. And, and he's going to have um, folks with him uh, who are, are helping to develop the plan and uh, present it to us. All right, that sounds super interesting. Thanks for lining that up. Does that include the all of the murals? Is that correct? TJ's got a question, Splen. Uh, you probably didn't hear that, but TJ's wondering if that includes all the murals that we've been seeing popping up around town. Yeah, that's Tune in next week, TJ. <laughs> <laughs> We'll try and get your questions answered, right? You're not going to want to miss that one. Okay? I know you're going to be chomping at the bit to find out. Is that the murals? Okay. Okay, so we're having fun here. Okay, so now the reason why we're here, uh, 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 the program that we're all looking forward to hearing from, uh, we've got some veterans joining us, and I'm going to hand the mic over to Paul McCandless and let him introduce our program today. So, Paul. In 1918, on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, the armistice between the Allied forces and Germany went into effect. This became known as Armistice Day and was set aside to commemorate the end of World War I. In 1954, the United, after the United States had fought in World War II and the Korean War, Congress changed the Armistice Day into Veterans Day to honor the veterans who have fought in our wars. In 1973, the draft ended. Since then, all service members have been volunteers. Today, we're honored to have two veterans, Army veteran Stephen Alvarez and Navy veteran Kinea Lachez of the Las Casitas Veterans Association to share their stories and remind us of the sacrifices that our veterans have made. So if you would, I would like to introduce Stephen um, to go ahead and give your presentation.
Hello. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can. Oh, we can too. All right. Uh, thank you guys for having. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I'm currently at work right now, so sorry for not being able to have video. Um, so to begin, I guess uh, I started my my service uh, when I was uh, 17, uh, a year before my 18th birthday, um, and I decided to join the uh, army. Uh, right after to right after high school um so let's see i picked uh to be a wheeled vehicle mechanic and um i did my basic training in south carolina uh fort jackson um let's see basic training i, I thought was uh probably one of my most favorite parts of uh my military career um that's where I got to shoot all the cool guns and uh, meet a bunch of new people uh, coming from a really small town in uh, Northern California. Um, it was um, uh, eye-opening experience to meet uh, people from all parts of life, um, but it was, it was pretty cool. Um, I think the mo my most favorite part of basic training was the uh, rock marches, uh, getting up super early in the morning, uh, going on a hike with your buddies and um, hating life at the beginning, but once you're done with it, um, you finally realize that that was pretty cool and uh, you wouldn't want to do it again, but it was good. It's nice looking back on those kind of things. Um, let's see. Uh, I did four years of uh, active duty, um, uh, starting in South Carolina, um, going to Maryland for a couple months for my mechanic training. Uh, then shooting off over to um, Washington State, uh, Fort Lewis for a couple months, and then finally um, finishing my uh, my term in Germany um, in Vilsack uh, and Grafenvier uh, training grounds in Germany. Um, I did 15 month, months in Iraq um, while I was on active duty. <clears throat> um, between 2007 and 2008. Uh, and then I ended my active duty career in 2009 and joined the reserves right after that. Um, I've been serving in the reserves uh, ever since. Um, I've uh, been on two additional tours, uh, one to Kuwait in 2012. Um, and then I just returned in January uh, from a tour in Iraq, in uh, Northern Iraq, uh, supporting the um, uh, the Western um, areas of Iraq. Um, so, um, let's see what else. So, um, I think uh, the service changed me in the way that if I wouldn't have joined, I would have never probably left my hometown. Um, my hometown's uh, really small, probably a population of uh, 2,000. Um, and most uh, people that grew up there, if they don't really uh, leave after the first couple of years, they just stay there for the rest of their lives. And I was pretty fortunate enough to get out and see the world. And um, it opened my eyes to uh, new things um, and able to meet new people. Um, when I got out of uh, active duty, it, it was uh, it was a little um, I don't know, like lonely, I guess you could say, um, because uh, being stuck with a, a bunch of uh, uh, people that um, day in and day out uh, they become your your family, and coming out of uh, a military service. Um, it's, it's, a, it, um, you don't really have that, that, uh, those people around you to support you, uh, the way that you would in the, the military. Um, so that was, uh, that's something to, I guess when, when service members come out of the military or coming out of active duty or even the reservists, um, that's uh, probably the hardest part. Um, what brought me to LPC is um, I've been a, a mechanic ever since um, 
joined the military on the civilian side and uh, the military side. Um, so I decided instead of uh, being on my hands and knees all the time, uh, breaking nuts and bolts, I decided to make a career change. So um, I found out about LPC through one of the, uh, I guess, uh, career days at the college. Um, I was taking a class there and I found out about the uh, Vet to Tech program. And um, it's a two-year program that uh, helps vet, vets um, get a degree in mechanical um, engineering technology technologies. And uh, I just graduated in 2018 and was hired on at Lawrence Livermore Labs at, uh, in um, 2019. Um, I guess that's about... All I got. Um, Yes. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. Hi, my name is Kenya. Um, thank you for having me again this year. I remember doing this last year as well. Um, happy early Veterans Day. Um, so a little bit about my story. Um, so I'm a Navy veteran. I decided to join um, in 2014, and I just got out. Well, it's two years now, 2019. Um, and after boot camp was in Great Lakes, Chicago, after I did my uh, boot camp training, I was sent to San Diego to learn my job, uh, which was a sonar technician. So basically our job was to kind of maintain, um, do maintenance on and the upkeep of the sonar system on board. Um, and we kind of were the second eyes for maneuvering the ship other than radar. Um, so I was in San Diego for about six months, completing my um, job training, and then I got my assignment to go to the USS Preble, which is a destroyer um, stationed in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. So that was pretty cool to go um, and be stationed there, as opposed to like Virginia or you know somewhere where it's cold. So that was that was nice. Um, <laughs> So I chose the Navy uh, because actually my little brother, I've, I'm the oldest out of four. So um, my brother, Luis, he's four years younger. Um, so at the time he was graduating high school and I was working at um, a family practice clinic as a medical assistant. Um, I knew I wanted to go back to college, um, but was thinking like, I don't want to be stuck with all these student loans and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we were kind of on the same, um, had the same idea to join the military. And he was like, oh, I'm looking at the Navy, you know, um, I heard you, you know, get to see a lot, go to different countries, you know, and stuff like that, deploying, being at sea. So it sounds fun. And I'm like, okay. So I thought about that. I was like, oh, that wouldn't be too bad. So the funny thing is he never joined the Navy. So I went to the Navy. Um, he actually did army reserves, but never got deployed or anything. So he never did any of that stuff. So that was pretty funny. Um, but anyways, um, so yeah, I decided to do, go to the military and kind of uh, do something else for a while. Um, something that was kind of bigger than myself and also get some help in continuing my education. Um, so that's, that's what happened. I went to USS Preble. Um, we deployed three times. Um, every deployment was about eight months long. So we would go out to sea and then we would uh, occasionally stop in different areas to um, you know, get supplies and um, do maintenance on the ship and stuff like that. Um, so I was really happy. I got to see different cultures. Um, went to like Japan, South Korea, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, um, Australia, Dubai, Bahrain. Guam. So that was really cool. Um, just traveling to those, you know, kind of get different perspective from, uh, you know, uh, just being in here in California. Um, originally um, from, well, I was born in Mexico, 
Um, but then my family, we lived in the Bay Area for a little bit and then in Tracy for pretty much most of my life. So um, transitioning from just being in Tracy to like seeing all that kind of stuff was pretty cool. Um, and also, so boot camp, uh, my impression of boot camp, it was easier than I expected. Um, there was a lot of yelling, but not too bad. Um, the only difficult thing for me was uh, that I was in Chicago. So, and I went there in January. So I literally, when I walked out of the bus, the cold kind of hit me and I was like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? It's so cold. I can barely breathe. How am I gonna, you know, um, make it through? Um, so just that different temperature change was like, I think the most challenging. Um, and then also uh, lack of sleep. So we only slept maybe like four hours every day. So I was like, oh my gosh, is this, is, is this how it's gonna be forever? I don't know if I can do this, it's too much. Um, but I got through it. And um, I guess the most memorable thing about boom camp was obviously the, our last obstacle. Um, they call it the USS Never Sail. Um, so uh, they're just the different obstacles, like taking out um, someone in a stretcher. They had like a simulated fire, so there's smoke everywhere and you have to take them out. Or um, there's like a big hole in the ship, so we have to plug it up, you know, prevent us from sinking. So that was pretty fun. Um, how, so the service changed me. Um, well, first of all, I'm the first to go to college um, and the first to join the military as well. So um, I'm a very timid person, so it kind of helped me uh, come out of my shell a little bit um, and made me become a little bit more confident in myself um, and also constantly being under pressure, being deployed, sleep deprived. I feel like now anything that comes my way is a little bit easier. Um, when you're deployed on a ship, you know, you have to, um, you learn to rely on yourself and other shipmates around you. you. Can't really like call a plumber or anything. You can't really call anybody. So you're just, it's just you and the shipmates. You form a strong bond to kind of just solve whatever problems you have when you're out at sea. Um, so now whenever I have a problem, you know, being in college, kind of try to look at it from all sides. So that lesson has really uh, been helpful for me. And also, um, you know, I, I, um, it has made me appreciate every, all the little things in life and just being grateful for what you have. Um, it was kind of funny because I, my job in the Navy is nothing, uh, it's very different from what I want to do. So um, I've always been interested in science and the human body. And um, so right now I'm majoring in allied health. And my hopes is to transfer next fall um, to a nursing program. And ultimately I wanna become a nurse practitioner. Um, other than that, the challenges, I guess, being a civilian again, um, I guess just being older than most of the uh, kids here in college, you know, 18, 19 year old is just kind of different. Um, other than that, I think I'm really grateful to be part of the Veterans First program here. Um, I think I wouldn't have been as successful with everything um, coming back to college if I wasn't a part of that. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, but yeah, overall, the Navy was a good experience um, and it prepared me well um, to, for the future. Um, but yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you again. Thank you, Kenya. Good. Um, so we probably have a few questions both coming in on chat and over uh, here from our live meeting. Do we have any questions right now? How about in our chat? We have some some many thank yous here in the chat for people who uh, appreciate hearing your stories. And without any further questions, um, oh, I know what I wanted to ask. So could could Stephen? Could I get you to start with a little bit of, of talking about the uh, 
the Veterans First program there, how that has, has helped you in you know, continuing your education? Um, so the Veterans First program, um, uh, so the first year I started off as uh, not really coming into the program very much, um, but as time progressed throughout my time in uh, college, it has helped me with um, finding out what I want to do next. Um, they have a really good, uh, amazing staff there that um, um, kind of mentors you um, in what you want to do. And um, they've uh, helped me to, um, I guess, pick my, my career in engineering. Um, so I definitely want to try to um, uh, continue on with uh, my bachelor's now that I have my associates. There, there is one question in the chat for Stephen. Glenn wants to know what small town he is from. Did you hear that, Stephen? Uh, yes. Uh, so the small town I grew up in is called Boonville. It's in the uh, Anderson Valley, which is about, I'd say, three hours north of here. Good wine. Good wine. Yeah, that's a wine growing region. Everybody here seems to be very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Kenya, could you talk about your uh, your experience with the Veterans First Program a little? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so I'm a part of the work study team, and um, you know, it's really humbling and they, I mean, Evelyn, Evelyn and Todd are great. They're always, um, you know, any question any veteran has that comes in here, um, you know, we help them out and they're just so amazed. Sometimes they come from different colleges and they're just like, wow, this is so much different from, you know, the college I was going to. Um, so I'm just really happy to be here and be a part of the Veterans First. Um, and yeah. Can you describe what the Veterans First Program is? What, what's it involved? We have a question here from the room. If you could describe what the Veterans First Program is and what it involves for us, please. Um, yes, yeah, so um, so like I said, Ms. Evelyn Andrews, she's the VA certifying official. So um, what I get working here, um, some you know students coming out of the service are kind of lost and don't know what the next step is or don't know how to sign up for classes, um, don't know how to certify with the VA. So we just kind of help them uh, with that process. Um, you know, since I went through it too, so I kind of know what to do. Um, so we just help them with that. Um, and we also have uh, counseling and we, all, we have different events happening all the time, like 2.2. Um, so that's pretty much the gist of what we do, just helping student veterans um, enroll and, um, you know, knowing that they're, they're not alone in the process, that we can help them out. David has a question, Paul. Okay, um, go ahead, David. Yes, uh, as for Kania, you mentioned a, a minute ago that your peers have talked about the differences between their college experiences. Uh, I, I was wondering if you noticed anything in particular about your experience at Las Positas compared to what you've heard from your peers. Um, yes, yeah, so I've heard um, from, well, from people that have attended other community colleges like Delta College, for example, um, they just don't have like a veterans first program really. And they kind of are left in the dark as to like, um, like certifying their courses or they're ending up having to pay out of pocket for certain courses and having problems with their benefits. So then when they come here and, you know, we kind of like take care of all that and kind of ease the process. So they were like, wow, I, you know, it's such a big difference from this college to that college. Um, so that's, that's. Fun. Thank you. I have a question. Um, how many uh, veterans are enrolled currently in the program? Um, I don't know the exact number, but I think last time I checked, it was about 400, 450 around there, student veterans. Mm -hmm. I have a question. You kind of you late, uh, uh, mentioned that they helped with benefits. Is it more than just giving you direction on your educational path? 
do they help in other areas like benefits or um, you know uh, certain types of programs other than just the educational is there are they a resource beyond the educational uh, uh, just beyond their education um yeah so we have a few other resources for example uh, there's like an emergency fund um, so if a veteran, you know, has a bill that they're struggling to pay a couple bills at home, you know, they can kind of uh, sign up for that, um, the relief fund to kind of help them financially. Um, we also have a diaper program. So veterans that have kids, little kids, um, we encourage them to sign up so they get free diapers if they're enrolled for the term. Um, so they can keep enrolling for that um, if they're a student here. Um, so that's another resource. Um, I'm trying to think of the other ones. We have a textbook loan. Um, so I guess kind of, that's kind of academic too. Uh, you know, they don't have money or don't want to spend on textbooks. You know, we have have them to loan out, so they don't have to spend that extra money on there. Um, and we also have um, counseling. Um, every I believe we're still going every every week. So you know, if someone's um, needing counseling, we have that, it's called chill and chat. Um, so they could go in there and then it's completely safe space to just, you know, kind of talk and de stress and all that kind of stuff. Okay, do we have any more questions either on the chat or the room? Okay, well, um, Stephen and Kenea, thank you so much for your time. We want you to know that we support the Veterans Program everywhere, but Las Casitas in particular. Several of us are being part of the 2.2 for 22 activity this fall and supporting you in that way. And we also um, support you in your careers and the futures of your careers. So thank you again for taking the time out of your day to uh, help us better understand the veteran you and your issues. Thank you so much. My wife and I went up to Las Vegas College last Friday and just walked all around the campus, up and down in every building we could get into. There were not a lot of students there, but I think people here in Livermore don't appreciate how that has grown into a full-fledged, very impressive campus with many, many different uh, courses of study. And uh, it, you'd really be proud of this school just looking at it. Thanks. Thanks. So TJ says, get out there. Go check out Las Positas, everybody. If you haven't been out to the campus in a while, uh, they've done a lot of good stuff out there growing on campus. So I want to thank uh, Paul and Stephen and Kenya. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Kenya. Okay. Kenya. 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 Yeah. Thank you. I want to thank you guys for coming today. We really appreciate you sharing uh, your experience with us uh, and uh, in honor of Veterans Day today or tomorrow. So thanks for coming. So I see we're a few minutes earlier than normal uh, for our cutoff time. Bob Cowan, did you want to make a donation? No, I want to make an announcement. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Bob raised the say There's a craft city meeting uh, tomorrow night at the uh, at the travel club, five o'clock. Okay, great. So uh, crab feed meeting, if you want to be part of that big fun and making that event happen, uh, meeting when, tomorrow night. When is it? Five o'clock. No, no, no. When is the crab feed? Uh, to be determined, currently scheduled for the first first Friday in February. Fourth, February fourth. Yeah. Oh, that, that, is, that date is not set in concrete. For sure. Uh, any any other announcements? Good things happening in anybody's lives? Any, anybody uh, celebrating anything? Come on, people, nothing. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll let y'all off early uh, for good behavior. Uh, I'm going to call it, and we'll see y'all next week.